Hey there, welcome to another Make Science Easy Chemistry lesson. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at how we use the periodic table. Now, you've already encountered the periodic table in the previous lesson. But in this lesson, we're going to look at how you actually use the periodic table and how we understand what it's actually telling us. Now, this is a vital lesson because really, for the rest of the chemistry course, you're going to be using the periodic table an awful lot. You might find you also use it in biology and you're very likely to use it in physics as well. So it's absolutely essential that you can use the periodic table. If you've not yet done so, pause the video now, go back to the last lesson, download a copy of the periodic table and print it off so that you have a physical copy in front of you that you can use to help you. It's going to make your life much, much easier. So, what is the periodic table? Well, very basically, it's just a way of organizing all of the elements. And all of the known elements are found within the periodic table. So that includes all 92 naturally occurring elements, as well as any artificial elements that have been made by people. Now the elements are placed in size order. And this is really important and it will become more apparent as you understand more about the periodic table. But hydrogen being our first element is our smallest, then helium, lithium, beryllium. So they go in order from left to right and then going down as well. So essentially how you would read a book. We then get obviously to the very bottom right hand side of our periodic table and we're going to be getting our largest elements there. Similar elements are found near to each other. What this essentially means is that elements that are close to each other in the periodic table will have similar properties, but there are rules to these patterns and we will look at this later on. So the very first thing that we need to know when we're understanding the periodic table is what groups are and what periods are. So the periodic table is obviously arranged into groups and periods. Groups in our periodic table are vertical. So here we've highlighted group one. These are also known as the alkali metals, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Group two is the next one along. Group three is perhaps not where you'd expect it. There is a middle section that is not counted as group three. So group three starts with boron. Group four is the next one along group five, group six, group seven, and last of all, group eight or group zero. The names are used interchangeably. Group zero is slightly more correct. It's also worth pointing out that the groups are written with Roman numerals. So we always, always, always use Roman numerals when describing the group. So group four will be group IV, for example. The middle of the periodic table, which is not part of a group, is known as the transition elements or the transition metals. Just remember that when we're talking about groups, we are never going to be talking about these transition elements. Now, if our groups are vertical, then our periods are horizontal. So period one is at the very top of the periodic table, and it only consists of two elements, hydrogen and helium. Now, often when people try to find things in the periodic table, they forget about period one being hydrogen and helium. Don't make that mistake. Hydrogen and helium are period one. Period two is the next period along, going down. So period three, period four, period five, period six, and last of all, period seven. The periods are numbered one to seven, and these just use normal numbers. We don't use Roman numerals for these at all. The bottom of the periodic table isn't something we need to worry about. They're called the lanthanides and the actinides. And for where we're at right now, they're just not important. OK, so we can find which element is located at different parts of the periodic table. So there's an element in group five, period three. So I'm going to give you a few seconds. Find group 5, find period 3, find the element in group 5, period 3. So, 
So group five going down, starting with oxygen. Period three going across, starting with sodium. So where the group and the period intersect, we have our element. So in this case, it is sulfur. So group five, period three is sulfur. We can also find the location of an element. So for example, if we take strontium, we may need to know the group and the period. So have a look at strontium. It's highlighted for you. Which group, which period are they in? So going down, we can see it is in group two. And going across, we can see it is in period five. So it's really, really important that you can locate elements based on their period and their group. And that if you know the name of an element, you can find out its group and its period. Just remember, groups are vertical, periods are horizontal. Now you've noticed, hopefully, that every element has a symbol and there is lots of important information in this symbol. The first thing to note is the atomic number. Now the atomic number is normally found at the top of the symbols, but it can be found at the bottom as well. So a simple way of remembering, the smaller number numerically is always the atomic number. And the atomic number tells us the number of protons that we find in that atom. So the atomic number always tells us the number of protons. And sometimes the atomic number is called the proton number. It's worth pointing out that the periodic table is organized by atomic number. So hydrogen, the smallest element, the first element, has an atomic number of one. Helium, the second smallest element, the second smallest atom, has an atomic number of two. Lithium, the third smallest element, has an atomic number of three, and so on. So every element has a different atomic number and the periodic table is arranged from smallest to largest. The next thing we need to look at is the mass number, which is also sometimes called the nucleon number. Now this sometimes can appear at the top of our symbol. So remember the mass number is always the numerically larger number. And the mass number is the average mass in an atom in something called atomic mass units. And atomic mass units are just the unit of mass in an atom and they're very arbitrary. And they're also very, very small. So don't worry too much about it. All you need to know is obviously the bigger the mass number, the more massive the atom is. And the mass number tells us the number of protons and neutrons that are found in an atom. So the atomic number only tells us the number of protons. The mass number tells us the number of protons and the number of neutrons found in an atom. We have the element name, which is pretty self-explanatory. And we have the element's symbol. The first letter of any symbol is always a capital letter. So in this case, carbon, capital C. If an element has more than one letter in its symbol, the subsequent letters are always lowercase. So copper, capital C, lowercase u. Sodium, capital N, lowercase a. Now that's a bit odd, isn't it? Sodium being Na. So don't expect all of the symbols to match the words you might expect them to. Magnesium, capital M, lowercase g. And you need to be able to identify all four things on a symbol and understand what they mean. In summary, elements are placed in the periodic table in order based on their atomic number. Similar elements are grouped together. Groups are vertical. Periods are horizontal. The middle section of the periodic table does not contain groups and is known as the transition elements. Every element has a symbol. The first letter of that symbol must be a capital letter. The atomic number tells us how many protons are in an atom. And the mass number tells us the combined number of protons and neutrons and the mass in atomic mass units. So I hope you have a bit of a better understanding of the periodic table 
and how you can use it. Until next lesson, keep on learning.